And the gospel today is the gospel according to John, chapter 6. The next day, when the people who remained after the feeding of the 5,000 saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Now for my 45-minute sermon. <laughs> buckle up. So when I was in seminary, I, uh, when I was at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in um, uh, Beverly, Matt, or near Beverly, um, my roommate uh, there was a uh, Baptist, actually. Nice guy. Uh, we had a great time together, actually. Uh, occasionally went out for a drink. Occasionally went out for a cigar, you know, so uh, this is in seminary, too. And the seminary itself was founded by the uh, evangelical church. Actually, Billy Graham had a big hand to do in, in, settle, in starting Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Um, but anyway, uh, it became sort of the Dallas Theological Seminary of the Northeast. Uh, so I, anyway, we were having a good time and me and my uh, Baptist roommate and I said, this is fun. I said, you know, um, do you have, do you do this at home? He's like, oh, I can't do any of this at home. I said, why not? He goes, my congregation would be very upset. If, you know, we, they're, they're teetotalers. They don't drink, they don't smoke, probably don't swear. I would not be welcome there. So uh, anyway, um, it was uh, interesting to find out that he sort of, was playing hooky, you know? He was in seminary, but he was acting like a, a college kid. And, well, technically, I guess. But anyway, we had a lot of good times. And one of the things we uh, used to argue a lot about was this whole notion of what does it mean, bread of life, right? John chapter six. John chapter six is full of such theological issues that uh, for anybody to, to wrap their hands around is, is it's almost impossible. So um, I, he used to say that he took the Bible somewhat literally. So I, as a Catholic, growing up Roman Catholic, I said, well, we believe that um, the bread and the wine at the Eucharist become the body and blood of Christ. I said, it's, it's in John chapter six, right? He goes, well, that's a metaphor. I said, well, it's interesting because like, you know, some things are metaphor for your group of theologians and for us some things are real and uh we had this conversation back and forth and uh, he was very upset to find out that i did not believe that the story of job in the bible was real i mean in the english version in the king james version of job it seems like a story right job is telling the story of this this uh, arm wrestling match between god and the devil and finally get the end of it says, you know, God is God through the good times in life and the bad times in life, whatever. But what you don't see in, is the Hebrew. When that was written, it was written as a poem. The whole book is a huge poem, all right? Telling a story in poetry fashion is one of the ways in which uh, the Bible was written. I do think that I take the Bible literarily 
all right? You see the difference between literally and literarily. Um, so it's a poem, it's a great poem. You know, uh, Jesus gave us parables, stories, right? Um, the Psalms are written, some of the Psalms are written in poetry, well, the whole, all the Psalms are written in poetry format. Um, so there's a difference between uh, this whole literally and metaphorically speaking that uh, we had this uh, argument about and but we were we remained very good friends even to today um even though he's wrong <laughs> right so um no but seriously <laughs> um, so like i grew up with this uh 18 letter word that the roman catholic used so well it was called transubstantiation finding out the word transubstantiation and knowing how to spell it was a big deal growing up and, um, and knowing what it meant was even a bigger deal. Uh, there was this doctrine that says that somewhere along the lines and during the Eucharistic prayers that the priest, the male priest, the <laughs> that is the only one that can do this, can sort of call down the Holy Spirit to make the little wafers that at one time were made by the nuns, by the way, um, delicious wafers, and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. So at some point in time during the Eucharistic prayers, uh, the wafer and the wine are transformed, transubstantiated from bread and wine into actually flesh and blood. We just can't see it because we're human beings. And that's what it meant. And you know, I kind of struggled with that. And to be honest with you, I just read a Pew report, uh, a survey amongst uh, Catholics that suggests that over 60% of Catholics in North America do not believe in transubstantiation. My guess is they couldn't spell it either, right? <laughs> so anyway, so they, they struggled with that, that concept. In the, uh, when, when Martin Luther came along, um, he needed to come up with a concept as well because he was reforming the church. And he came up with a uh, concept called consubstantiation, right? I think it's two letters less. So it's probably not as important. But consubstantiation in the Lutheran tradition was that God is present in everything. Um, and therefore, in the substance of the bread and the wine, God, Jesus Christ is really present there, but in still bread and wine, okay? Consubstantiation. And there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, probably the best explanation I ever got was from an Orthodox, an Eastern Orthodox priest. And um, I highly recommend, as you guys are doing, is get into mysticism, okay? Um, if you're not a mystic, uh, you know, you really should become one, especially if you're a Christian, because so there's so much about our faith that we don't understand. And so I was talking to this Orthodox priest about transubstantiation, constant. He goes, yeah, that sounds good. And, you know, and I said, well, what do you guys believe in? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, we, and, and he says, we really believe, this Greek Orthodox priest said, we believe in the uh, real presence of Jesus Christ in the bread and the wine. And, but he goes, I don't know how it happens. He goes, it's a mystery. And that's a great thing about Eastern Orthodoxy is that they actually believe it's okay to be a mystery, right? Uh, I don't know is a good answer. You know, in the mystical world, that's, works for me. I mean, I, I don't have to come up with these long words and these long legalistic definitions. And whether you're evangelical or Catholic or Methodist or Episcopalian or whatever, um, understanding what's going on during the Eucharist is less important than living it, okay? And what I mean by that is that you just live the faith the way Jesus Christ taught the apostles how to lead the faith in the first century. What I mean by that is that amazingly, um, they had the sort of same Eastern perspective of the bread and wine. Now, one of the problems that Christians faced in the first, second, third century world was the accusation of cannibalism, right? And here's an amazing aspect of, the, uh, of that first apostolic era of the church, the first 300 years of the church, which we call the apostolic era, is that uh, one of the um, ways in which you can get a, a Christian arrested was to ask him about the Eucharist. Oh yeah, it, the body and blood of Christ. We celebrate, you know, Jesus's body and blood uh, 
becoming uh, the bread and wine becoming the body and blood of Christ. The way Jesus taught us, all four Gospels, on the night he was betrayed, do this in remembrance of me, all that stuff. Now, that sounds a little grim for some people who don't understand it. So they were accused of cannibalism, which, you know, I'm guessing that at that point in time, and I was talking to my evangelical friend about this, I said, that would have been a great moment for you know, us, some kind of theological doctrine story, paper written, thesis in the first century world where a Christian says, no, wait, it's just a symbol. You know, before you're being fed to the lions, you might want to try to explain that, you know, try to get out of it, at least. Um, I probably could have gotten out of it. But anyway, you know, oh, no, it's just a metaphor. Don't, 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 don't accuse me of cannibalism. It's just a symbol. But they didn't because they believed it. They believed that during the celebration, during the Last Supper, during the, 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 the celebration, the festival of the table, it was Jesus Christ presence, right? And I, again, I love the, I'm going to go with the Eastern Orthodox Church here. I don't know how it happens, you know, but when we celebrate the Eucharist, there's something special about receiving the bread and the wine. And there's something special for me because when I take in this, this prayerfully meditated uh, celebration of bread and wine, and I take in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, it, it actually propels me to want to become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, right? You are receiving Christ for the world so that you can become Christ for the world. Now, here's my final mystical message, okay? We are all, we don't understand our divinity. You know, a lot of people, when I say you're divine or something like that, they, they, they're they not quite, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily an easy thing to comprehend. How is it that I am divine? How is it that I am the body of Christ for the world? You know, and to be honest, it's, it, as a flawed human being, it's a difficult concept to embrace. But... As someone who truly, truly believes that the body and blood of Jesus Christ is surging through my body and blood, that somehow Jesus cho it chooses to live in me, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, I, there's, there's times in my life where I need to exemplify that. I need to manifest it, ideally all the time, right? It's, I mean, for me, it's impossible to exemplify it all the time, but I try. Right. And that part of that divinity becomes real. It's going to become very real when we're celebrating at the banquet, at the table in heaven. Right. When we're actually celebrating that, we'll be manifesting our divinity along with this body of Christ, this entire group of saints and angels. Right. And uh, as we are here on earth, like the, that, like the Lord's Prayer says, on earth as it is in heaven. We're celebrating it here as it is in heaven. When we celebrate it there, we, we will actually embody and totally understand what it means to be the body of Christ, right? And uh, all I can say about that is that, um, you know, as difficult as it is to wrap your mind around, um, you know, uh, try at least to wrap your mind around the fact that someday um, we'll all be together. And it's not going to matter Actually, it's not going to matter uh, if you can believe or spell transubstantiation, which, <coughs> great. I think in heaven they'd be like, that's awesome. You know, <laughs> I remember you were seven years old and you spelled transubstantiation. Um, good for you. But um, it's, it's going to mean a little bit less up there because we'll understand. Just like the um, Orthodox priest says, all mysteries will be revealed. Amen. Amen. Amen.